David Gran has spent nearly a year on the New York Times bestsellers list with his latest work, The Wager, and can also lay claim to the book, Killers of the Flower Moon, that inspired the film, now up for 10 Oscars tomorrow night. An award-winning journalist whose writings have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and New York Times, just to name a few, his foray into nonfiction exploded 15 years ago into mainstream success. Three of his six books hit number one. Notoriety for a guy who preferred to remain unknown, but who appreciates getting the word out on his often untold histories. I wish to find a lost city. From the jungles of the Amazon. You said no one had been here before. To the plains of Oklahoma. Whose land is this? My land. Even the notorious halls of San Quentin Penitentiary. David Grant's writing has taken readers and moviegoers alike through adventures far and wide. So Hollywood seems to pick these up not in order. Yes. The first made into film was The Lost City of Z. Yes. Are we close? And then came Old Excuse Man McGun. I'd like to open up an account. Well, great. What type of account do you have in mind? This kind. And now comes Killers of Flower Moon. Money flows freely here now. It's very bewildering to me because I never think of these stories as movies. I really never do. I think of them as just, how am I going to create images in the reader's minds, visual images through words, but not through actual visuals. He's left his mark on the literary world by uncovering thrilling tales otherwise lost to time. Most written from this tiny home office, kept in a perpetual state of organized chaos. <laughs> what are you <laughs> laughing at? I, I, <laughs> you're making fun of my my, uh, my, my sacred room. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't like put this all together for us, did well, you? Well, I cleaned a space for us <laughs> so we could, walk, we could walk in. From precious documents and relics to photographs like these, which informed his research into the murders of Osage Native Americans. I still have a fair amount of the Killers of the Flower Moon documents oh, wow. around here. Wow, this isn't in the book. No, this photograph, I had a lot of photographs that were not in the book. It's kind of a way often of trying to chase history even as it's often vanishing. His history began in New York City. The son of an oncologist and the first woman CEO of Putnam Penguin Publishing. Though he says she didn't grant him any favors. My mom always gave me one piece of advice, which is whatever you do, don't become a writer. Shut up. I swear. And I think she thought it was going to be too hard for me. She thought it would be like too hard a life. And so I, like any good son, I did the exact opposite. And I became a writer and I, and I proved her wrong. His grandmother was the one who fueled his passion for storytelling. My grandfather had suffered a stroke. And my grandmother would tell me these stories about how he had fled from Russia on foot how he was this daredevil who raced uh, on motorcycles, how he went down the Khyber Pass in Afghanistan almost and crashed. And I just kept looking at this figure who really couldn't move much and talk. And yet suddenly she had brought him to life with me with these stories. Which drove him to look beyond the surface with a little help from his favorite fictional private eye. There's a great quote from Sherlock Holmes where he said, if we could just peer into the roof of all these other houses, we would find all these remarkable stories that the mind of humans could never invent. In other words, truth is stranger than fiction. And I've always kind of believed that. And so I'm like a professional snoop. Every time I hear a conversation, I'm overhearing, taking little notes. His sixth book, The Wager, a tale of shipwreck, mutiny, and murder in the mid-18th century, is no exception. I come upon this 18th century account written by a midshipman named John Byron, who was only 16 years old when he set sail on the voyage. But then, you know, I think the key is I actually read it. <laughs> because when you start reading it, it's written in this really old English. I think most people, and even me, when I first started reading it, I was like, what is this? It's kind of faded. But then if you actually keep reading it, you're like, wait a second, shipwreck, mutiny, starvation? So I think it's just that curiosity to just kind of keep following the thread and see where it leads you. And sometimes it will lead you nowhere. But if you keep pulling, you'll end up usually somewhere pretty darn interesting. Grant admits his attention to detail is obsessive. 
I'll do about two years of research and then I start to get gnawed by some doubt. And then before I know it, I'll do something foolish like go traipsing through the Amazon, <laughs> chasing some explorer who disappeared in the 1920s. Or the Antarctic. But yes, or go, go on a little boat to uh, Wager Island. It ends up breathing life and deepening my understanding. On average, he spends five years on each book, which often stems from ideas meant to satisfy his magazine editors. So the pitch for The Old Man and the Gun. Yeah, the pitch, well, you know what's funny about the pitch for The Old Man and the Gun? There's the first story I ever pitched to The New Yorker, and uh, I was so nervous. I was like, I can't mess up this story. I mean, the elements are just too good. It was about this guy who was robbing banks into his 70s, and then he was breaking out of prisons, and he broke out of San Quentin in a kayak on the side in which he rubbed rub-a-dub-dub, -dub. he painted on the side. So I thought, I can't mess up that story. Do you feel the responsibility of telling untold hidden histories? Yes, because I think part of what interests me is to shine a light on things that have been obscured, often obscured for a reason. There was a certain intent to erase history. How does David Grand maintain his oh, incredible lightness what, what of being? We're going to go see the Knicks. And the Hornets. We're going to see the Knicks win. <laughs> oh, you think so? <laughs> I do. You want to bet? No. If you don't have a release, if you don't have an escape, you will lose your mind. I spend way too much time, like, evaluating prospects, looking at, like, the financial statements of players and will they fit with the team and listening to podcasts. There's way too much um, Knicks and NBA devotion. Grimes! <laughs> Do you ever wager a few? You know, I don't wager. I'm too neurotic to wager. Because to bet, you need to be rational. And the one space where I want to be irrational is in the space of sports. It's a pretty safe bet. He won't be giving up either obsession anytime soon. He's already started work on his next book. I have a little idea now, so we will see. I'm not ready yet to talk about it, but I'm circling around it. What part of the world? Can you at least tease us on that? Espionage. So we'll see. So the subject, not the location, now known. He's feeling the pressure to finish it. You say, what's the pressure? That's the pressure. I just want to retire. <laughs> Can you? No. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I was so struck by how lighthearted and just fun David Grand was. He was just a delight to interview, but just so incredibly serious about his subject matter. And yeah. he really takes it mm -hmm. to heart. 